A topic that I've been interested in recently is dating the books of the Old Testament. And here's a book that uh, discusses that topic. This is How the Bible Became a Book by William Schneiderwind. And the title, by the way, seems to be an example of uh, uh, biblical parallelism. This was published in 2004. There's some testimonials on the back. So one is by Israel Finkelstein. He was the co-author, as mentioned here, of this book, the, Bib the Bible Unearthed. In this book, and this book is a popularization of some of uh, Finkelstein's archeological work, he makes the claim in this book that the United Kingdom of David and Solomon basically didn't exist, that David and Solomon, in fact, ruled a fairly small area around Jerusalem. Now, Schneiderwin himself doesn't seem to agree with that, though he acknowledges that maybe the United Kingdom wasn't as big as uh, sometimes claimed in the Bible. Uh, he does think that the United Kingdom included both Judah and the Northern Kingdom of Israel. The other testimonial is by this author right here, Benjamin Summer. And he's, he, we're told here, he's the author of A Prophet Reads Scripture, Allusion in Isaiah 40 through 66. So this, this is the part of Isaiah that's sometimes called Deutero Isaiah because the time jumps forward a couple hundred years to the Persian period. Now, allusion, uh, in Isaiah, allusion to other parts of the Bible, uh, which is what this book is about, are useful for dating uh, because uh, Deutero Isaiah must be later than anything that it alludes to. Here's the table of contents, and I like to focus on chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8. But there was a footnote in uh, uh, chapter 4 that caught my eye. So in chapter four, Schneiderwin talks a little bit about the use of Ugaritic for understanding early Hebrew. And uh, I'd like to take a look at this footnote right here. So um, he mentions Mitchell de Hood. And since I had uh, looked at Mitchell de Hood's commentary on the Psalms uh, previously, uh, I found this interesting. What he says is that sometimes the use of Ugaritic can go too far, as it does in Mitchell de Hood's brilliant but idiosyncratic three-volume commentary on the Psalms. So, so uh, Mitchell de Hood is brilliant, but he's idiosyncratic, and he went too far. But there's nothing that backs this up. In fact, it's not clear if this is Schneiderwin's personal opinion or whether he's just repeating uh, what other authors have said. So I would have appreciated a bit more uh, detail here. Schneiderwin thinks that it was during the reign of Hezekiah, who ruled around 700 BC, that biblical literature began to be written down. So he says, the Bible as we know it began to take shape in Jerusalem in the late 8th century BCE, in the days of Isaiah the prophet and Hezekiah the king of Judah. An influx of refugees, often educated from the north, and Assyrian depredations in the Shephelah caused an increase in urbanization in Jerusalem. Schneiderwin says that this put more scribal resources at the disposal of Hezekiah, and hence uh, there was an increase in biblical activity. Uh, so he quotes here David Noel Friedman, who says, The collection of the books of the four prophets was assembled during the reign of Hezekiah to celebrate and interpret the extraordinary sequence of events associated with the Assyrian invasion of Judah and investment of Jerusalem, along with the departure of the Assyrian army and the deliverance of the city. Ultimately, all these books support the Davidic monarchy and Hezekiah's scribes, would have had good reason to collect them. 
Schneiderwin doesn't say this explicitly, but Nathan, uh, who lived in the 10th century, and Elijah, who lived in the 9th century, don't have books named after them. But Isaiah, Amos, and Hosea, and, and Micah, uh, all from the 8th century do. Uh, if the late 8th century was when it became a regular practice to record the words of the prophets, uh, that would explain the reason why. Uh, here he talks a bit about Elijah and Elisha. He says the Elijah, Elisha tales seem likely to have been a collection of oral prophetic stories. However, details about military campaigns, building projects, and the lengths of reigns were likely drawn from the royal archives. Uh, so here, uh, Shanita Wen says, a central part of Hezekiah's, Hezekiah's political agenda seems to have been to recreate the golden age of Israel, namely the age of David and Solomon. Even though archaeology has suggested that the Davidic Solomonic Empire was a rather modest affair, the first kings of Israel had managed to create a unified kingdom from the diverse tribes and clans that characterized the second millennium. And so here is where Schneidewin is going against Finkelstein. So it is interesting perhaps to take a look at this footnote. So it's a reference to an article by uh, Baruch Halpern, Erasing History, and I was able to find that online. So there's not a lot of uh, hard facts in the article. It mentions the Tel Dan Stele, which refers to the House of David. And this article is uh, arguing against uh, people that Halpern calls minimalists who don't believe that the kingdom of David existed at all. And so a reference to the house of David uh, would be evidence against that. But it is it does not show that the, uh, um, the house of David also ruled over the northern kingdom. In fact, in the Tel Dan Staley, it also mentions the kingdom of Israel. So at this point in history, uh, the House of David did not um, rule over uh, the Northern Kingdom. So, so there's really no uh, evidence in here at all that runs uh, a, a counter to Finkelstein. Schneiderwin believes that uh, at least part of the Proverbs dates to the reign of Hezekiah. He points to verse 25. These also are Proverbs of Solomon which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied. So um, a possible explanation for this line is that the Proverbs of Solomon were originally orally preserved and the men of Hezekiah, his scribes, were the ones who first wrote them down. Schneiderwin also floats the idea that they might have originally been anonymous but were ascribed to Solomon to promote the notion of a Solomonic golden age uh, that Hezekiah wanted to create. So what, uh, in general, uh, got written down during the reign of Hezekiah? Well, here's what uh, Schneiderwin says about that. The time has come to briefly assess how this social-political context might have shaped the composition of biblical texts. The literary activity of Hezekiah's reign was a projection of royal power and ideology, particularly as it related to the fall of the north and the survival of the house of David and Judah. Hezekiah's literary projects apparently included historical work, the collection of mosaic and priestly traditions, and the writing down of prophetic traditions, including Isaiah of Jerusalem, Amos, and Hosea. Many of these writings appear to have been modified or extended during the reign of Josiah or later. So how do we decide if a particular verse goes back to Hezekiah? Schneiderwin sometimes uses the attitude toward the Northern Kingdom, which he says was generally positive 
during the reign of Hezekiah and generally negative during the reign of Josiah. The reason is that Hezekiah wanted to win the allegiance of the recent refugees from the fall of Samaria. Since Finkelstein argues that the notion of the United Kingdom was a fiction, we might ask ourselves, when is the earliest reference to the United Kingdom? And Shanita Wynn has a couple of uh, uh, candidates. So the first one is in 1 Kings chapter 12. Uh, and it goes, And King Rehoboam made haste to mount his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. And he argues that this was written uh, in the reign of Hezekiah because uh, it was during the reign of Hezekiah that the kingdom of Israel still existed. So he doesn't think that to this day uh, could have been written during, say, the reign of Josiah. And here's another one in the, uh, uh, the book of Isaiah. Uh, and it goes, the Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. So this is in Isaiah 7, which is often thought to be the part of Isaiah that dates to the 8th century. And it uh, clearly refers to Ephraim uh, leaving the kingdom of Judah. Um, now, I don't think this entire verse uh, was written uh, during the kingdom, uh, during the reign of Hezekiah. Um, and the reason why is because of this awkward uh, reference to the king of Assyria. If you look at the actual Hebrew, which is right here, so, so there is uh, Judah, and then there's the et, the direct object marker, uh, marker and then it's Melech Ashur, so the king of uh, Assyria. And so, there's this uh, great book, this is pretty much a must-have by Fishbane, uh, Biblical Interpretation in Ancient Israel. And it gives us methods for detecting uh, lines that were added by scribes as sort of annotations. And the et marker um, is described right here. And um, uh, often when you encounter the et marker, and it's sort of awkwardly uh, added at the end of a clause, and it doesn't actually seem to be the actual direct object, then um, often that's some sort of like explica uh, explication by the scribes. So in this case, the scribes wanted to make it clear that uh, um, what would be coming, <laughs> these bad days that would be coming would be uh, uh, the ravaging that the king of Assyria would inflict upon uh, uh, the kingdom of Israel. In the late seventh century, there's evidence that reading and writing spread to the masses. Schneiderwin thinks that there was also a shift in attitude towards writing. Instead of merely recording oral traditions, the writings themselves came to be regarded as authoritative. Here, Schneiderwin says that hundreds of Hebrew inscriptions of a variety of types testify to the widespread use of writing during the late Judean monarchy. Already there is a marked increase in epigraphic remains in the late 8th century, so during the reign of Hezekiah. This epigraphic explosion continues until the invasions and exiles by the Babylonians in the early 6th century BCE. This spread of writing was a critical moment in the formation of biblical literature. Like Devetta in the 19th century, Schneiderwin believes that the book of Deuteronomy dates to the reign of Josiah, or at least an earlier version of it. Here he quotes the second book of Kings. The high priest Hilkiah said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the scroll of the law in the house of the Lord. And here he says, uh, although the priest Hilkiah discovers the scroll of the covenant, which is an explicit reference to the legislation of Exodus 20 through 
through 23, referred to in Exodus 24, 7, the Josionic reforms followed the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy was the Magna Carta of Josiah's political and religious reforms. Ironically, Deuteronomy advocates strong restraints on the power of the king. And there's more about those restraints here. Over here, it says that uh, Deuteronomy was not the document of a strong monarchy. Rather, the assassination of King Ammon and the installation by the people of the land, the um, ha Aretz of the eight-year-old Josiah as king provided the opportunity for the people of the land to limit the monarch's power. When Josiah grew older, he initiated wide-ranging religious reforms that would reclaim the king's role as the head of the temple. Also in this chapter, uh, Schneiderwin talks about the uh, the, the silver scroll that was discovered in uh, the hills above the Valley of Hinnom. And the reason these are significant is because these contain the, the oldest known biblical verses. They're quite short. So one, is, uh, part of it is uh, from Numbers 6, 24 to 26, and it reads, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. May he be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his face upon you. And then there's also a quote from Deuteronomy. Know therefore that only the Lord your God is God, the steadfast God, who keeps his covenant faithfully to the thousandth generation of those who love him and keep his commandments. So because these are possibly the oldest known biblical verses to be written down, the dating of them is uh, critical. And here, Schneiderwin says that they're dated to the late seventh century BCE. But if we look at the footnote, uh, it says that the paleographic dating of the amulets has been the subject of some discussion. Unfortunately, much of the earlier discussion was based on early photographs and consequently inaccurate drawings. C. G. Barquet, M. Lundberg, Vaughn, and B. Zuckerman. The amulets from Ketef Hinnom, a new edition, and I assume that's supposed to read evaluation. Uh, new Near Eastern Archaeology forthcoming. Now this was written almost 20 years ago, so I assume that this did get published, but I have not tracked it down. I'd like to see that. I did manage to get access to the article Schneiderwin cites on the Ketep Hinnom scrolls. Anyone with access to JSTOR can download this. On the dating of the scrolls, some scholars, such as J. Renz, have suggested that they're Hellenistic, but the authors of this article believe that they're late monarchy, so the 7th or early 6th century BCE. This article has a map, an overview map of Jerusalem, and it shows the Hinnom Valley and then the hill on the opposite side of the valley where the Ketaf Hinnom tomb is located. And here is a map of the tomb. So this is the main room uh, 24, and then here's the repository room 25, and this is where the first scroll was found. Um, so the way the tomb was used is bodies would be placed on benches in this room right here and left to decompose. And when they were just bones, the bones would then be moved into the repository. Uh, so this room right here. Um, they even have, um, so they did an excavation of room 25, and here is where the Ketaf Hinnom scroll was found. Um, this isn't a complete description of the dig. So the other objects that were found, uh, such as things like pottery that can potentially be dated, they aren't described here. Um, but the floor of the repository was excavated. Uh, the Ketaf Hinnom scroll was found seven centimeters above uh, the absolute bottom, and the average uh, depth of the accumulation was about 65 centimeters. Most of the article discusses interpretation of the letters on the scrolls. 
there. They mentioned that these scrolls are tiny, about three centimeters wide, and they weren't meant to be read. They're, they were a bit like scrolls Jews post on doorposts today, or which they wear in phylacteries. Since they weren't meant to be read, the scribes didn't write that neatly. And in any case, neat writing was difficult because of the small size. So here are a couple studies of the, the different letters that are on the scrolls. Uh, here's another one right here. And then here we are getting to where they uh, reconstruct what they think the scrolls say. So here is the first scroll, uh, what they think the modern Hebrew letter equivalents are. So this is uh, supposedly um, Deuteronomy from Deuteronomy 7. Chapter 7 is on the Torah. Now the classical documentary hypothesis most people probably know uh, asserts that the Torah was originally four separate documents and those four separate documents are given the names J, E, P, and D. Now Schneiderwin uh, does appear to believe in the P or priestly document and the D document which was Deuteronomy. But he allows the possibility that the J and E documents were actually just oral traditions that were first written down when they were added to the P document. Um, and by the way, uh, which document or source do the verses in the Ketaf Hinnom scrolls come from? Well, one of the, one of the verses comes from Deuteronomy. But the other is in numbers, and which uh, documentary hypothesis source d what d does that come from? And to answer that, I took a look at this book right here. So this is a decomposition of the, uh, the Torah as translated by the NRSV. Uh, and it, it decomposes the Torah into the supposed sources according to the documentary hypothesis. Uh, at least the documentary hypothesis according to Martin Note, his uh, history of the Pentateuchal traditions. And it has the actual supposed text of these sources, but all I need is the index in the back. And this index gives us all of the verses in the priestly document, uh, in the J document, the Elohist document. Um, but the, the Ketoff Hinnom verse is Numbers 6.24 to 6.26. Uh, and according to this, that's a, a non-source text. So it was not in any of the four uh, source documents. Schneiderwin notes that Deuteronomy emphasizes the act of writing far more than Exodus. On page 127, he says, in sum, the revelation of the covenant code in the book of Exodus was originally depicted as an oral revelation. There was no reading of texts. There was no writing of texts. The whole revelation reflected the orality of ancient Israel. The book of Deuteronomy would make textuality central to the revelation. And Schneewin uses this word textuality a lot. It irks me a little bit, but to understand what he means by it, um, perhaps we should just note that he's using it in contrast with orality. Anyway, he goes on. Deuteronomy would also have to address the apparent tension between this newly introduced text that Moses wrote down and the tablets of stone written by the finger of God. When the Exodus and Sinai traditions were incorporated into the Pentateuch and connected with the Deuteronomistic history, an account of the writing of the Book of the Covenant was introduced by the interpretive repetition in Exodus 24. When did this textualization of the Torah happen? Since the scroll of the covenant is central to the Josianic religious reforms, the formation of the Pentateuch as we know it must have begun in the late 7th century BCE. Here's what uh, Shnita has to say about what was written on the tablets. 
So according to this natural reading of the text, neither the legal code of ancient Israel nor the Decalogue was written on the famous two stone tablets. Rather, God had revealed the plans for his own tabernacle and its facilities, as well as the Sabbath commandment to worship at the tabernacle. Um, and he also makes this perhaps interesting note. What of the fact that the second revelation asserts that God wrote these tablets with his own finger? The best ancient analogy for such a claim would be the Mesopotamian tablets of destiny. So these are mentioned in the Enuma Elish. The tablets of destiny are a divine writing produced at the creation of the world. It may be that the powerful image of divine writing, the finger of God, used in Exodus 31, 18, is appropriate precisely because it is also a metaphor for creation, as suggested by Psalm 8, 3. Uh, so Schneiderwin, uh, further down the page, he quotes uh, God from Exodus 25, where he says, There I will meet with you, and I will speak to you from above the cover, from between the two cherubim that are on top of the Ark of the Pact, all that I will command you concerning the people of Israel. Actually, Shneewin says, this would suggest that Torah is received only after the Ark with the tablets is completed and placed in the tabernacle. After the tabernacle is built, God comes to dwell in the tabernacle. From God's dwelling place in the tabernacle, he speaks to the people of Israel. In this reading, Torah would be literally the speaking of God from his dwelling place, teaching Israel, not a written text. Here on page 151, uh, Schneiderwin writes, the biblical account of the fate of Jehoiakim and the royal family was essentially corroborated by an archive of 290 clay tablets excavated in the 1930s. These texts, written in cuneiform, were found in the vaults below one of the public buildings near the famous Ishtar Gate leading into the city of Babylon. They date from the years 595 to 570 BCE and list payments of rations and oil and barley to prominent political prisoners from Nebuchadnezzar's military campaigns. Most important for us is the record of payments to Jehoiakim, king of Judah, or as it is transcribed from the Akkadian cuneiform writing, Anna Yaukinu Shari Sha Yahudu. So Shari is the Akkadian word for king. Yahu Kinu is how they write Yehoiakim. And then there's Yahudu, Judah. These texts continue to call Jehoiakim the king of Judah. He was treated as royalty, even though he was under house arrest by the Babylonians. Rations are supplied to Jehoiakim, the princes of Judah, and the royal Judean entourage. One representative list may be translated as follows. And we can see here that there are five princes and eight men in the entourage. So here on page uh, 149, Schneiderwin writes, the critical figure for answering the what, how, and why questions about writing during exile is King Jehoiakim. The Book of Kings ends with a short prose account of the fate of the last kings of Judah. Central to the narrative is the fate of King Jehoiakim in Babylon. In fact, the Book of Kings ends with this king's release from prison. The question is, why? Why is the fate of King Jehoiakim, a prisoner in Babylon for some 37 years before his release in 550 BCE, so important to this narrative of the exile? The obvious answer is that the same Jehoiakim was behind the writing of the Bible during the exile. And then jumping ahead to page 153, uh, Shneedwin writes, the historical narrative in the Book of Kings had originally concluded with the account of King Josiah. Scholars have made this determination based on several considerations. First, the book's rigid narrative structure of ascension formulas and death burial changes before the death of Josiah. Apparently, Josiah's death was not part of the original narrative. When the appendix was added, completing the narrative of the monarchy and telling the fate of Jehoiakim, the new writer uses a different narrative structure. This is further borne out by the fact that the prophetess Huldah, 
a central figure supporting Josiah's reforms in the Book of Kings had predicted that Josiah would die peacefully. Josiah, however, dies in battle. From a narrative point of view, Josiah's death disrupts the rigid structure of the placement of the death burial notices that had characterized the Book of Kings until this point in the narrative. What does the appendix contribute? The new ending of the Book of Kings essentially absolves Jehoiakim from wrongdoing, justifies his surrender to the Babylonians, confirms his status as the legitimate king of Judah, even while dining in the palace of Babylon. Book Jeremiah, he says, one of the strangest stories in the composition of biblical literature is the book of Jeremiah. We essentially have two different books of Jeremiah. A book of Jeremiah, not the canonical book of Jeremiah, was completed before the third Babylonian exile of the Judeans in 582 BC. This book is actually hinted at within the canonical book of Jeremiah itself. I will bring upon that land all the words that I have spoken against it, everything that is written within this scroll, which Jeremiah prophesied against all the nations. Uh, and that's Jeremiah 25, 13. The scroll of Jeremiah then suffered two different fates. One, uh, the shorter non-canonical book of Jeremiah was apparently edited in Egypt and later became the basis for the Greek translation of the book of Jeremiah known as the Septuagint. This non-canonical version will not concern us here. The longer canonical Jeremiah was edited in Babylon under the auspices of the exiled Judean royal court. And then over here, Schneiderwin provides us with the mapping of uh, the verses in Masoretic text and what they correspond to in the Greek version of uh, Jeremiah. Uh, Schneiderwin makes uh, a few remarks about Zerubbabel who was the grandson of Jehoiakim and who uh, returned uh, to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. And he says, the royal regent Zerubbabel leads a contingent of exiles back to the Persian prophets of Yehud. It's worth noting that Zerubbabel is a fairly common Babylonian name that means seat of Babylon. Another prominent member of the royal family, Sheshbazar, also has a Babylonian name. He is listed as the first governor of Yehud in the Book of Ezra. These Babylonian names probably reflect the close and perhaps even fond connection that the Judean royal family had with the city of Babylon. Uh. Zerubbabel, representing the exiled Judean royal family, returns to Jerusalem. It is interesting, however, that the only member of the Judean royal family that is mentioned as returning from Babylon is Zerubbabel. At this point in the historical record, however, Zerubbabel disappears. Some scholars have suggested that the Persians imprisoned or killed him. And there's no footnote for this and really no evidence for it. It's just um, the, the Persians, um, it is thought, wanted to rule the province through the temple, and uh, a member of the Davidic monarchy um, perhaps might have been regarded as a threat by them. Um, so there are also chapters. Uh, chapters 9 is on uh, the Persian period, chapter 10 on the Hellenistic period. Um, th so I enjoyed this book. It's a nice balance between scholarly and readable. It's not very long, and it works as an introduction to the topic. Uh, if you have an interest in the Old Testament, I think you'd probably find this interesting.